All right, we're live now. Vince, thanks for coming on our first ever Legal Lunch Bite. We're not new to this process. We did 100 episodes of our firm's blog during COVID. We took a bit of a hiatus. Uh, we're retooling now a little bit just to try a new format, new guests, new questions. And certainly we're in a different time of life now as we were during COVID. So I'm excited to have you. Maybe you can uh, provide an intro to folks who don't know you since I'll be a regular face on this, but uh, but you'll be a, an intermittent face. So maybe you can provide everybody a little bit of a background on you, where you came from, uh, what you're doing now, and, and uh, then we get into our topic today, which is gonna be the cannabis outlook for 2024. Sure, yeah, thanks for having me to the inaugural. I'm, I'm happy to be here and happy new year, Jonathan. And thanks, and you too. Yeah, so my name is Vince Lowoski. You can probably see that on the screen. I'm one of the partners here along with Jonathan and Harris Swalowski. I am in Portland, Oregon, and my practice is business law, general business law, meaning not litigation, helping businesses do things and commercial real estate. And that's kind of what I've done my whole career. And I'm highly specialized in a couple of industries, cannabis and psychedelics. We have robust programs for those controlled substances here in Oregon. That's what we'll be talking about today, in my understanding. But uh, in a nutshell, that's who I am and, and what I do. And I've been doing that. I've been a lawyer for 13 years now. I like you describing yourself as a lawyer who gets things done. I feel like that's what my practice entails as well. It's more, we have clients with good problems and bad problems or, or good problems and difficult problems. And getting them from A to B is really what I enjoy doing, helping them get through it in a way. Um, you know, after you and I've been practicing for, I think I'm in my 12th year now. And, uh, and I forget sometimes how how much cyclicality there is for us in our work and, and what the value is for lawyers who see hundreds of transactions compared to our entrepreneurs that see certain deals only once or twice in their lifetime. So and it's certainly interesting to be at this nexus of cannabis. I mean, you've been involved in cannabis since how early in your career? Er, really early, maybe second year, kind of accidentally. We just had a client walk into the firm that nobody else would work with <laughs> at the time. And my boss said, are you okay with that? And I said, yeah, I think so. And, you know, because I was willing to work with that guy, he started referring other stuff. And I just sort of wrote what became a pretty big wave eventually. So, um, yeah, I've been doing it my whole career and, and followed along and kind of written about it almost like a historian over the years and have a big archive of how our program's gone in Oregon and what's happened federally, I guess, since that point, which has been strikes and gutters, I guess. And we can talk about any of it if you want, or, or just looking forward to 2024. Yeah, I'm very interested because when I joined the firm four or five years ago, I had a little bit of cannabis exposure and, uh, and tied in for a couple of years pretty hard on, on M&A in Washington. So Remember I got that. a very interesting viewpoint as well. Uh, and, and, uh, but you've always been the one who I've looked to for uh, you know, all of us, I think, have said, okay, if Vince, Vince knows what's going on, let's get Vince's take on this because you've, like you said, you've been breathing it, living it for almost your whole career. So maybe start with Oregon and, and differentiate Oregon a bit from, from surrounding states, maybe California, Washington, what makes Oregon quirky in its own way. And then maybe we can eventually branch out to other interesting states or developments that, that you're going to see in 2024 and, and maybe even international if we have a few minutes at the end. Sure. Yeah. Oregon's an interesting state. It's always been kind of a vanguard state for cannabis. Um, without going too far back, I can say that we were the first state to allow non-residents to own these businesses back. I think that was in 2016 or something like that. So it's always been a pretty open market. Uh, it got a little bit too open in some people's thinking such that there were so many licenses and just so much cannabis in the state that the state moved to sort of curtail the available pool of licenses a few years ago. And you know, there's been a lot of triage and consolidation. And, and right now it's like a lot of the Western states and a lot of the country in general where, you know, industry is generally having a hard time finding margins and finding success. Just in this, there's a whole slew of reasons for that, starting with federal prohibition on down. But I would say it's a tougher market. It's a still consolidating market. Um, we have a pretty good partnership with our regulators here trying to address issues in the market. And, you know, I foresee better things in 2024, I think, um, for some macroeconomic reasons, but also because of some potential changes in federal law, which we can talk about here in a bit, if you like. And how would you describe your relationship with the regulators generally? I, are, are Oregon regulators open? I know that in your blogs, you've been openly critical about some of the things you've seen 
uh, is that well received? Has it has it you feel like it's affected anything, or or you feel like you're still a more of a lone voice crying in the wilderness? <laughs> well, I yeah, I think it's pretty collaborative approach. I mean, we don't pull punches here, and you know, sometimes I work with them, and sometimes we're working against them. Ultimately, we're always working in our clients' best interest, but. We've been collaborative with the regulators over the years. We've helped them write rules and we've helped them write guidance and we talk to them. I mean, a lot of them have gone, it's like the classic regulatory thing where they work in the commission and then they go outside maybe into some private practice and back in and, and we've just kind of been there all the while. So I know they I know they read what we're writing because sometimes I'll write something and I'll get a very quick like email. Hey, what about this correction you could make? And I'll, I'll think about it. I think the relationship's healthy. I guess is where I'd put it. I mean, everybody's professional. They understand we're not going to agree with what they're doing a lot. And they understand we're going to call them out when we feel like we should call them out. But we also compliment them when they deserve it. And I feel like they often deserve it. And they're trying to do a good job in general. So healthy relationship overall, I'd say. Interesting. And Oregon's nice because we have a direct line in. Like, for instance, I work with our colleagues in California. And they can't just pick up the phone generally and call somebody high up in the BCC. The state doesn't work like that. And they're not as accessible. Oregon's very accessible. Um, we can talk to regulators in any number of ways we present with them, et cetera. So I, I appreciate that about our state. Mm -hmm. And I think in Washington, we try to pick up the phone. And I have had some good conversations, I think, candid conversations. They don't like to say anything over the phone. They wouldn't put in writing. And so I think they default to written sure. responses when they can. But I found Washington regulators to be fairly uh, fairly level-headed as well when, when we're looking for input on transactions. and Because invariably, uh, you know, we run into issues that just don't come up in, in the regulators' minds. As practitioners, we comes up and we're saying this this form looks like it should fit, and I know this is the form you want me right. to use, but right. there are some fields here that just don't make sense or either don't work, uh, it just don't right. fit our situation. And they're not lawyers, and you they think of things a little bit differently sometimes. I mean, a few of them are lawyers sometimes, but they may just have a different perspective on things. and. Uh, yeah, it's good that you can take that collaborative approach with them. I appreciate that. So let's go turn to national then. I know there have been some some big changes. I think rescheduling or at least discussion about rescheduling uh, has been going on for years. Uh, what happened in 2023 and what, what's likely to happen in 2024 in that regard? Yeah, so there was really big news on that point in 2023. I think it was in late August when we had an announcement that uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, in consultation with the downstream agency you may have heard of called the Food and Drug Administration, recommended to the Department of Justice, or excuse me, to the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration, that marijuana should be moved from its current place as a Schedule 1 controlled substance down the ladder to Schedule 3, which would mean that it's still a controlled substance, but it would make life better for a lot of cannabis operators for a few reasons in the primary of which is taxation. Cannabis businesses are taxed, I would say oppressively at the federal level. They're not allowed to claim a lot of ordinary business deductions. If you start any other kind of business in America, you know, a coffee shop or restaurant, whatever it is, you're allowed to deduct your payroll, your utilities, all, all of these things, which reduces your taxable income. Cannabis operators generally can't do that with the exception of a narrow category of goods. I'm not gonna geek out further about that, but I'll just tell you that they're taxed differently and more heavily than other businesses. And if marijuana moves to schedule three per this recommendation, that would change. And that's a really big deal. So, I mean, we'll see, it's kind of a, and it's, the whole process is pretty opaque. Uh, the memo that recommended this descheduling was released, but so heavily redacted as to be, you know, hardly beneficial to read. and it's a public process where there's going to be opportunity for comment. There'll probably be litigation around it. Certain people I'm sure don't want cannabis to be treated uh, a little bit more leniently by the federal government. Mm -hmm. And another thing I'd say about that is people tend not to really appreciate what it means in other senses. For instance, it won't make interstate commerce legal. So here where I'm sitting in Oregon, we won't be able to sell our cannabis down to California or anywhere else. And another thing that's, helpful to understand about it is cannabis would still be a controlled substance, right? It would just be on a different schedule. So if you think of other schedule con three controlled substances, I talk about, you know, codeine, anabolic steroids, it would be on the same level as those. And it would still be kind of a funny federal state tensions where you have all of these shops. Imagine a codeine shop just kind of openly selling codeine everywhere around the country or, or an anabolic steroid shop. Cannabis would be that. It would be like a drug on schedule three 
being sold in the open, notwithstanding prohibition in federal law. So does that, would that open up the banking at all? I mean, I know, I know banking is quote unquote open at this stage and the banks are, are the bottleneck because of their stringent requirements in KYC requirements. So they're really, I've seen at least personally, maybe tell me if I'm wrong. I see the banking hiccups as more of an internal uh, banks decide their own risk profile that cannabis just isn't worth it. And so that's been a limitation is, is there more than, than what I'm describing? If it goes to Schedule 3, I don't think there will be huge changes. I think there may be changes faster if we get federal legislation on banking passed, like the Safe Banking Act that has gone through the House like seven times, but seems to fail every time to get a Senate hearing. It finally made it through the Judiciary Committee last year, which is big news, but it never quite gets there. I think that would be the change that banks need to really bank these businesses like broadly and openly and publicly. Right now, I mean, the industry's banked in a sense. It's mostly smaller state chartered credit unions. It's more limited services. It's more expensive and cumbersome banking. Um, but I think it's a move to Schedule Three wouldn't really fix that. Uh, that's I mean, it's it, we need some sort of change in federal legislation to fix that, not administrative action. Okay, so we are we're trying to keep this to fifteen minutes or less. Okay. So we're already at, we're already 10 or so minutes in. So I want to mention one thing, which is you do have a Canna webinar coming up next Wednesday at, at 12 PT. Do you want to yeah. get a little preview on that? Yeah, that it's going to be me. It's going to be uh, two other partners here that we have Griffin Thorne down in our Los Angeles office. He's a business uh, attorney like me, and he also is licensed up in Washington and uh, Jesse Mondry, who's here in Portland with me, and he's a litigator. So what we're going to cover is just trends that we're seeing in the cannabis industry currently and what we expect to see in 2024. And those are pretty smart guys and they, they've done a lot of public speaking. I'll be interested to hear their perspective, but it's going to be a free flowing uh, Q&A type webinar and it's free to attend. So people can submit questions in advance and we'll pick out the ones we want to answer that are good and we'll answer them and or people can just type stuff into the live chat and we'll deal with it as we go. But I mean, it'll be an interesting hour and uh, I look forward to that. So yeah, sign up should be on our blog. Excellent. And, and we can drop the link for that sign up in the in the comments of this video as well when when we uh, uh, republish it. Uh, all right. So last question then. What's happening internationally with cannabis? Oh, good question. So a lot of things are happening internationally with cannabis. It, the, the restrictions were removed to some extent on some of the cannabis trade a couple of years ago now. We've been helping clients do interesting things like ship seeds uh, from the U.S. to Europe. You never used to be able to comfortably do that with a like a sufficient legal basis to do so. But based on like a DEA letter from early 2022, people are taking the position now that marijuana seeds, even if they'll grow up and germinate into big old flowering intoxicating plants, that those are not actually controlled substances, the seeds themselves until they germinate. So people have been sending those across borders, big companies, we've been helping them do that. We have a pretty developed international trade practice here at the firm. And I you know, have to rely on those guys heavily with some of that stuff. But um, so that, that's been interesting. And just, you know, restraints of trades are a little bit less than they were. And then you just have other countries continue to liberalize their laws and come on mind. I think foremost, Right now, in most people's minds would be Germany, um, just because it's the biggest country in Europe, essentially the biggest economic engine, in my understanding, in Europe. But you've just got stuff going on all over the world with, you know, medical cannabis programs. And cannabis is uh, under international law, can be studied for research and scientific purposes. And they, it's essentially acknowledges medical marijuana, which is something we don't have here in the U.S. So it's just a different game and it's fun to watch that evolve and it's fun to watch, you know, different com countries take different approaches and watch the international trade uh, regime sort of build out. And I should add that, you know, people are already trading in hemp and that's another part of the cannabis plan we, we talk about frequently here. That's great. I have been involved in some of those cross-border discussions. I'm always interested to see which clients are doing what and, and how quickly they go international or finding partners international that want to do some kind of collaborative effort. Uh, mm -hmm. It's been very, very interesting and, and certainly more, much more international than I expected when I first started working in the cannabis space. So sure. um, we're, we're at our time, Vince. I want to thank you for spending a few minutes. Hope that everyone who tuned in today found it valuable and we'll be spinning up other topics later of a, of a wide variety based on things we're seeing in our different practice areas. We'll touch on China. We'll touch more on cannabis. 
China to Mexico, China to Latin America, China to uh, Southeast Asia, just anything and everything that's uh, that's noteworthy. We'll find uh, certainly no shortage of things to talk about and uh, hope we get to have you on again before too long, Vince. Great. Thanks for having me. Thanks a lot. Okay. All right. Thanks, Vince. Thanks, everyone.